Welcome to the Brain Gain Youngstown Leadership Series podcast. Each week, we'll learn from leaders who are driving change and making an impact. Now, here's your host, the CEO of the Youngstown Publishing Company, Jeff Leo Herman. Today on the podcast, you will hear about leadership lessons learned in the emergency room and how the pandemic has created a much more nimble and agile healthcare system. And I'm thrilled to introduce our guest, Dr. John Llewellyn. He is the market president of Mercy Health Youngstown. John and I had a great wide ranging conversation. Uh, we did it via Zoom, so it's not, it takes a minute to warm up because it's a virtual environment. But uh, once we got rolling, we had a great time. Thanks for joining us and please welcome Dr. John Llewellyn. So here we are with Dr. John Llewellyn today. John, thanks so much for joining us via Zoom today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Absolutely. Thrilled to have you on the Brain Gate podcast. And we want to jump right in and understand what did you want to do when you were a child? Did you aspire to be a doctor? Is that always something that uh, that you wanted to do when grow- you were growing up? Yeah, it's a great question, actually. And, and that's actually probably more the case than I would like to admit. Um, I grew up in a very small town in Western Pennsylvania, and we had one physician in our community. And uh, he sat at the other end of the the pew in church. Hmm. And he was one of those people that I kind of looked at and said, wow, it's, what he does is kind of neat. And as time went on, uh, I ended up working for him. I assisted him in his office with with uh, trimming his bushes and mowing his grass and carrying things around for him. And um, I really struck up a friendship with him. And it was kind of an interesting situation because at the time I was a, a high school student and he was in his 80s. Um, just oh. winding down his practice. So you ended up with this very unique friendship between uh, someone who was just starting off in their career and someone who was just winding down. And, and when I graduated from high school, he, he came to my front door in a rather formal manner and knocked on the door. My mom said that I had a guest and I went to the door and he had a present wrapped for me and said, I got you something for your graduation. And it was a stethoscope, <laughs> uh, which was interesting. Um, right. I still have that stethoscope. And that, that was actually for my high school graduation. Oh, Wow. Wow. Now, was it the person or the practice? What did, were you fascinated by science and, and, you know, things, you know, in medicine or, or was it literally the person that drew you into interest? In no, no, I think, I think it was the fact that you could actually take the, the scientific stuff that I thought was cool as a kid mm-hmm. and apply it to a job where you dealt with people every day. Mm. And, and, and you got to see those, the interplay between the two, you know, when I would I work for him in that setting, I would see, magazines and journals sitting about his office and his home. And I'd say, wow, that's cool. Like people actually write about that stuff and then people read it. Um, and, and so it was more of that type of a scenario. Okay. And was it, were there things that, um, is this something you had, you know, was medical school a no brainer for you or, or was it a challenge that you had you, pre- I should say, had you prepared along the way to that end? Yeah, I, I think it's challenging uh, for anyone, but as I reflect back on it, I made my college decision largely uh, predicated upon the the one one data point, and that was the the facility of the educational institution of those that I applied to that that had the highest percentage acceptance rate into medical school. So even back as a sort of a high school student, I was making my college decision based upon how I could take that next step. I see. And what uh, when as far as a field of study or a practice area, w- at what point did, did the decision come there? Yeah, that's interesting for me because I um, attended college locally at Westminster College and went on to medical school at uh, Penn State's medical school at the Milton S. Hershey Medical Center. And uh, while I was in medical school, I, my wife and I got married and I was we, our apartment was immediately adjacent to the helipad for the medical center. Oh, and and she found that to be a bit of an annoyance when we moved <laughs> in. And, and I found it to be a little bit interesting because as I as I went through my medical education, I said, I, I want to be the guy who's on the receiving end of those helicopters, like being able to take care of the receiving end of that would be cool. Right. That would be that would be success. And that's really what led me into emergency medicine, which was my my practice specialty. So are you a problem solver? Because triage is required, right? I mean, you're we're talking real time decision making when milliseconds count. Is that something that, does that give you energy? Does it feed your soul? Yeah, I think so. I think so. And I think that's one of the reasons I found it exciting because it was never the same job two days in a row. And um, you didn't know what you were doing. You didn't have a schedule when you went to work, right? You went to work at 7 a.m. and 
you took care of whatever you were confronted with until 7 p.m. and you went home, uh, wow. which which to me is a very uh, rewarding way to spend my time. Absolutely, and, and I'm sure the the you've probably been in more situations. You have you know effectively a lot of stories to share. But how did you handle the family dynamics? Like what what was it like? You, you know, leadership is critical in this area, right? When you're doing urgent care type of treatment, you have to rally your colleagues and your peers. You have to manage the family and their expectations, the patient, uh, be it, you know, conscious or not. So what, what type of leadership practices did you use in those more intense situations? Yeah, I, I think probably most important uh, amongst the uh, people who apply their trade as I did as an emergency physician is that you have a sense of calm about what you do um, and the willingness to make decisions with limited information. And you spend your day doing that. Um, I once had someone say to me that you don't seem very excited about my medical problem. And I said, well, exactly how excited would you like me to be? (laughs) Because if I'm excited, there's a problem. Right. And you, well, don't right. want to be, you don't want to be on the other end of that excitement. <laughs> That's true. Right. That excitement uh, could be a problem. A, I've never, I'm so excited. I've never seen this before. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what do we do with that? Right. Mm-hmm. But, but you're right. So rational, a rational approach, a pragmatic approach, a measured approach really matters in areas where, like we said, it, it you know, seconds count. Mm-hmm. And I think it's transitioned very nicely into my administrative career because um, in my administrative role, I'm often faced with that exact same situation, right? The, 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 very, the various things that occur throughout the course of a day or a week that were unanticipated and having the willingness to make decisions with incomplete information, um, but being okay with those decisions and, and, and trying to be right more than you're wrong. Right. Do you, do you, so the, you know, I, we often talk about, um, ambiguous situations, right, where there's limited information and the ability to make a decision, being decisive, do you find that, you know, it's it's better at least to be decisive and take a course of action because you'll know if it's right or wrong versus inaction, which then you're kind of stuck at status quo? Yeah, I think that the, the challenge for many people is they people sometimes view inaction as the lack of making a decision. And I view it a little differently. I view inaction as a very intentional decision such that if I'm choosing to do nothing, then I'm making a choice. Um, and that's rarely the right choice. Um, generally, I'm much more action-oriented in those decisions that I would make. Right. And, and, and you know, in many cases, mistakes are recoverable, right? I mean, mm-hmm. that's – when you take action, do you – they're measured choices. And you're right, make, not taking action is also a choice. Mm-hmm. Inaction is a choice to not do anything – uh, and, and I guess it's about learning, right? If you do nothing, you don't learn anything new, mm-hmm. perhaps, but is, is taking action a function of helping you learn to just continue down a path? Yeah, I think so. I, I, it, when you take action, you're taking a proactive step to manage whatever situation that you're confronted with. Mm-hmm. By making the decision to, to not take action causes you to be reactive. And I, I find it generally more favorable to be proactive and leaning into the situation on your toes, if you would, rather than on your heels and reacting to a situation. Right. 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 Well, as you mentioned before, by definition, um, emergency rooms, emergency medicine, it's different every single minute of every single day. And so you're, you know, things happen, right? Patients come in with conditions and then you have an offensive response, you know, or you're on the offense, right? Mm-hmm. Um, kind of trying to resolve those problems. Are there, is that is that an approach you've always taken, or is that something you've learned to be more more aggressive or less aggressive? Or how do you, you know, kind of change your settings, so to speak? And have, have they changed over time? Yeah, I think they've matured over time. <laughs> I would hope that they've matured over time. Mm-hmm. Frankly, the. In my in my administrative capacity today, I find myself falling back on many of those those practice patterns, if you would, and converting them, bringing them forward into this different set of decisions. And I, I find myself generally pushing forward uh, rather than allowing the world to impact us um, with us again back on our heels. So sometimes those wins are very small wins, and you have to collect the small ones because. The big ones uh, sometimes are a bit more elusive, 
but but having that continuous momentum of small wins within an organization does a does a lot to to change the morale of the organization um, from from the executive to the the, the frontline worker uh, they feel that so I, I very much I very much try to lean in and um, continuously advance the cause if you would because if you're not doing that that people very quickly pick up on the right your, your complacency if you would do you have a goal setting process that you use. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and and again, much of my goal setting falls back um, on my clinical bias. So I have a bias mm -hmm. that, that our goal should be patient centric in what we do. Not only in terms of what I did when I was working at the bedside, but what we do as we develop the the corporate entity that we operate in in the Mahoning Valley. Uh, it's it's very hard for me to wrap my mind around um, us doing things purely because they make fiscal sense, um, right? Or, or us doing things because they make strategic sense if they also don't bring value to the, the patient in the community. Right. And, and so that process of, you know, long-term goal setting, right. So to, to make change over time, you have to, you know, set, set goals and establish milestones. But you're, what I heard you say is that it's celebrating those quick wins mm -hmm. and, and literally day by day patient, a pa patient centric approach means every individual is a data point, mm -hmm. right. And every individual is a chance to kind of, convey, you know, reinforce your goals or communicate, you know, how we solved a certain problem. And then, and that is, does that set the example leading forward? Yeah, I think so. And a, a very clear example in healthcare would be, you know, um, people um, regularly publish the rates of complications that occur in hospitals and people like to set goals around rates of complications. And the challenge I, I face personally is the only acceptable rate of a complication is zero. Right. Because, if, if I ask those that are setting the goals, whether it's acceptable for their loved one to be the, the one person who has the complication, they pause, right? Because they're like, well, no, that doesn't make any sense. I'm like, well, but that's what we're talking about here. Shouldn't we be striving to have zero defects? Because our product is a human being that we're providing care to and who has entrusted us with their well-being. Why do you think that is that that zero defects? That's a m mantra in manufacturing, right? You hear ISO nine thousand one standards, um, zero def defects. I mean, we're talking once again down to you know de decimal precision into the thousands, right? But mm -hmm. but do you th has it been acceptable for there to be for that not to be the case in, as it relates to people and humans and medical treatment? Yeah, I, I think sometimes people get a bit confused historically with the quote art of medicine. And the science of medicine. So I, I had the opportunity several years ago to go through the Six Sigma Black Belt training program, and to me, to me, that just resonated because that's exactly what you're talking about. You're you're working out the defects, and sometimes those working out those defects is an aspirational um, goal, uh, and it's it's not a goal that can be met in a day or a week or sometimes in a year for a number of reasons. That that being said, if you don't have those aspirational goals, then then what are you settling for? And I, I think many times um, people in healthcare have fallen back on the quote individual nature of each of us to assume that there, that variation equates to defects in care being delivered. And that's not something I buy because the, the, the biology, the physiology, the, the biochemistry of each of us is exactly the same. Right. So it, sh it should be completely predictable and avoidable in hmm. terms of, in terms of the way we approach the care. How, how do you manage uh, kind of wearing your administrative hat, the business side of the equation compared to the patient side of the equation? Is that, is that a balancing act or is it very clear it's patient centric? Yeah. So, so it's interesting. I sort of two answers to that. When I, when I uh, assumed this role a couple of years ago, I left my formal clinical practice behind after sort of having uh, a career where I juggled administrative responsibilities and balance those against my day-to-day -day clinical work. And one of the things that's uh, been a learning for me as I transition to uh, an administrative role on a full-time basis is those, those clinical biases, as I've mentioned, don't go away. They're, they're still there because those decisions still quickly relate back to a patient you cared for, whether that patient was cared for two years ago or 20 years ago, they come back very quickly in your mind. So keeping that front and center for me is very, keeping that fresh is very, very important because I, I think it does lend a different air to the decision-making process within a healthcare organization. Hmm. So are there, you know, you mentioned Six Sigma, uh, have you, are you a fan of uh, 
Jack Welch and the GE method? Is that, were those the case studies? You know, I've never yeah, some, some of those were. Yeah, some of those were. And I think I think the challenge is there are a plethora of of great structures around which you can um, develop a high performing organization. Uh, you mentioned uh, an example. I mentioned an example. There are many others. Um, Toyota, produ- the production system being in, uh, another. Um, I, I think the challenge is inside all of those is this notion that um, you have a tool set um, that you can choose to deploy um, in the appropriate situation to solve a defined series of, of problems. And in, in doing so, um, more closely perfect the experience or the product. In our case, a product being a healthy patient. We're going to transition here to, um, you know, and so often we learn from our mistakes and we want to dig into, say, perhaps, uh, you know, in your time and experience, perhaps some leadership mistakes you've made and mm-hmm. and things you're willing to share uh, from an instructive standpoint. So, uh, but first, we're going to take a break and thank uh, the members of the Brain Gain Coalition. The Brain Gain is a collaborative effort, and we'd like to thank our headlining sponsors, including Farmers National Bank, Sweeney Chevrolet Buick GMC, the Mahoning Valley Manufacturers Coalition, and Southwoods Health. Also included are Eastern Gateway Community College, PNC Bank, the Moransky Companies, the Mahoning County Career and Technical Center, the Youngstown Business Incubator, Simon Roofing, the DeBartolo Corporation, Youngstown State University, and junior achievement of the Mahoning Valley. And we're back. So, John, uh, any leadership mistakes you'd like to share? Things that you can uh, share with our audience? Things you've learned along the way? Yeah, I, I think that the, the challenge many of us, including me, face as we, our career progresses is being able to let go of those things which once occupied much of your time and your priority and move on to those those new challenges as your role progresses in an organization or between organizations and then delegate those things that were once cherished parts of what you did mm-hmm. and, and be, being careful being careful to not micromanage those newly accountable individuals it can be hard and I think that's something that that I've continued to work uh, to master, um, because all of us have a great deal of passion for those things with which we're entrusted. And then you move on. And then as you do that, you you if you're in the same organization, you kind of you kind of sometimes have a hard time letting go. Um, but being able to let go enough to to take on those new challenges is is tough. And I, that's something I think that um, I and others have probably struggled with from time to time, is being sure that you're adequately um, mentoring and delegating as you move on in your career um, so that others can not only be effective, but also so that you can be uh, an effective um, leader in your new role. How, how far do you let delegation go? Because we're dealing with so often you hear in business, well, it's not life and death. You know, I'm, I make signs for a living Um, (laughs) unless it's a stop sign. I'm not, well, I shouldn't joke about that stuff, but uh, how, I, how far do you let delegation go before you step in and just say, you know, because it is life and death? Yeah, I, I, that's a great question. And, and one of the interesting things that, that, that exists in healthcare is exactly what you just alluded to. It is life and death in some situations, right? So, so how, how much of a leash do you allow people and how much independence do you, do you support? I, I think that the key with that is it, it varies in, in day-to-day and person-to-person and topic-to-topic. And you, you, you really need to set um, very clear um, guide rails around the decision-making capacity and the expectations of those delegated leaders. And I think as you do that and you do it successfully, the leaders actually over time gain more and more and more leeway. Um, and that, um, if you would, allows me as the, the leader of the market to, to increasingly take on new responsibilities. So it's, it's, it's really a win-win when, when you do it well. But I think the key is establishing, A, great communication, and, and B, a mutually agreed upon guide rails so that everybody understands uh, where we're going, how we're going to get there, but, but also very clearly how to communicate when, when a problem arises and, and have a, as a real comfort level 
in managing that. As I started my emergency medicine residency, and this is a, a, a fun memory in many ways, there were eight of us sitting around a table um, the day before we started our, our clinical experience. So we were fresh out of medical school. We were feeling pretty smart. We had zero experience taking care of patients. And our residency director was in the room with us. And, and he said uh, very, with a, with a very insightfully, he said, so really there's only two rules in this residency and every one of you need to be able to recite them now and you need to be able to recite them when you finish your residency. The first rule is never make a mistake. Wow. The second rule is when you do, because you will, the first call is to me. And, and interestingly, that, that stayed with me because that's, that's really um, encapsulates much of what we need to do on a daily basis, right? We strive to not make mistakes. We strive to, to, do, to do good. It doesn't matter whether we're in healthcare or whether we're in another business. But, but there, will become a, there will come a time when we make mistakes, when errors occur. But you have to be able to feel perfectly comfortable escalating those immediately so that they can be dealt with. And I think that that level of transparency that he was trying to communicate to us um, has been something that stayed with me throughout both my clinical and my management career. Right. As, as hard it is, as it is um, to immediately try to reconcile or rectify through full communication, right? The full mm-hmm. rundown, uh, you know, it's often difficult and makes you feel uncomfortable but you're right. That transparency is required to solve something quickly. Mm-hmm. Right. And it also, it also puts it to rest immediately, right? You don't, there's none of this, there's none of this tension that exists in the workplace. It doesn't, it doesn't exist. You take the tension entirely away because when, when an error occurs, you have one and only one goal call. Right. And, and, we'll, and we'll deal with it. No, you're right. I, we, we have tensions every day, you know, work or home. Sometimes your best, you know, what do they say? Rip it off, rip off the bandaid fast, right? Just, just jump in, solve it. You know, a couple of minutes of pain is better than weeks of discomfort or weeks of, you know, kind of odd, odd experiences, odd relationships. Absolutely. Yeah. I, this notion of um, how do you coach thriving in an ambiguous environment? Because that's an area, that's a leadership area. I think, you know, ambiguous environments are great opportunities because it is ambiguous and there isn't a clear course of action. So taking a course of action is great. And that's something we work with kids on, right? Just make a decision. So do you coach the people that you're, you're working with uh, delegating on, you know, they want to feel discomfort. They want to feel like they want to feel that decision and embrace the ambiguity. Is that something that comes up? Yeah, I think so. And, and, you know, I think one of the things that we're blessed with at, at Mercy is that we, we have a very strong um, mission-oriented uh, organization history, uh, not only locally in the Valley, but, but, but broader than that. And, and that, that mission-oriented um, structure that goes back more than a century um, really um, attracts Mm-hmm. Uh, a different group of leaders in many ways. And it, at the same time, um, it attracts leaders who, who understand how, how difficult it is to not only make decisions as it relates to the, the functionality of what they do on a day-to-day basis, but also make decisions that on another axis align with our mission on a day-to-day basis. So people are being um, continuously presented with scenarios that, that test their ability to make decisions, if you would, on more than one axis or more than one plane. And that adds a, a different layer, layer of ambiguity. And there are people who come to that and say, you know what, th- this isn't for me. Like, like, this isn't for me. I was really successful in my old job, but I, this isn't something I want. There are other people who, who embrace it because of its complexity. And those people that embrace it are, are often those that, that are the most successful, ultimately, because right. they're, look, they're looking for that environment. They're looking for that complex environment where decisions sometimes aren't easy and the expectations are very high. Right, right. That um, You're right, the complexity, you know, that, that's also entrepreneurial environments, right? And, and it's part of the challenge of entrepreneurship or the challenge of problem solving in com- complex environments is it's intellectually stimulating and it does attract a different type of person. Mm-hmm. Right. And so um, do you, at the end of the day, do you always fall back on mission? So if, if there's a decision to be made, is it easy sometimes because this is our mission and this is why we're doing it because our mission is clear. Yeah, I think it helps 
I think it helps that the the challenge that that an organization like ours that's so mission focused can sometimes run into is they get out in front of themselves a little bit with the mission and they can put their uh, their uh, financial solvency at risk. And that that's something that we balance and we talk about every day. And that is, you know, we want to maximize our impact um, to the valley. But yet at the same time, we must be solvent. So there's no question that we must be solvent. So um, uh, really, if you look at our, our local leadership team, we have a vice president of mission and we have a chief financial officer. Boom, boom. Working <laughs> side by side with me. Now, that's great for me. That's great. I love that. Right. It's, to me, that it, that's, that's where it's at in many ways. That being said, there are people who would find that challenging. Like right. you have a point counterpoint with every decision that you're making. And then you add in the layer of complexity of the clinicians who are sitting at the table as peers to those, those individuals. And you end up with a very interesting conversation from time to time right. about, about where, where we are, where we need to go and what the right balance of, of um, revenue generating activity, which must right. exist for us to be solvent might be, but also what the, what the, the right commitment to the community in terms of mission development needs to be, because that's actually who we are. Um, so, so it creates a very dynamic environment. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, almost, you know, you're conducting an orchestra, right? You have hmm. uh, the strings, the brass, the percussion, and they all have to play together and you have to uh, create beautiful music, if you will. Uh, but sometimes that requires, you know, what do they say? More cowbell? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Can I use that reference here? <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. You know, I spent, I spent 20 years, I spent 20 seasons coaching my, my four kids youth sports teams in a variety of sports, basketball, lacrosse, and football. Right. And you had a variety of kids show up every year, right? You didn't pick your team. You have no control over your team whatsoever. You, I'm right. just there to help. How can I help? And you set the expectations for the team. And you also share with the team that, that, that we're going to win. Mm-hmm. Right? We're going to win. Mm-hmm. And they look at you crazy because they don't know the guy standing beside them. And they may or may not be friends in school and they may or may not be in the same neighborhood. They may or may not be in the same socioeconomic class. But you share with them what, why we're there, like what our mission is, right? Mm-hmm. And that we're going to win. Before long, they're winning. And I think right. that's very much something that I've brought forward into the workplace where I am because we have a very disparate group of professionals by intent, hand selected to be disparate and provide a broad variety of, of backgrounds. Right. But sharing that vision that together we're going to win, period, end of sentence, really causes them to all focus because they feel like they're in a safe environment. And in that safe environment, we're going to succeed. Right. That's true. I, that, that winning mindset, right? And, and um, I loved your point around you have to be solvent because to make a societal impact, it requires funding, right? Mm-hmm. And, and so if you aren't solvent, you can't make the impact you want to make and you can't support your mission. Mm-hmm. And so that balancing act is, um, yeah, like you said, every day, you know, if it's not emergency room medicine, it's um, administration. It's every day is a different day, I'm sure. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. So um, what does this region need? So thinking about, you know, your market focus and, you know, you've seen your organization evolve over time. What's your perspective on the current state of our region here in Northeast Ohio and Western Pennsylvania, and uh, anything you would you would like to see change from a leadership standpoint? I'm I'm pretty bullish, I think, in a good way on on where we're going. Not only as an organization, but w- where I see the valley moving, and the the potential is really limitless. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes, just looking with our own, own organization, people don't realize the, the the jewels that we have here in the Mahoning Valley, the St. Elizabeth Youngstown Hospital is the largest hospital of Bon Secours Mercy Health, our parent organizations. Really? 50, 50 hospitals in seven states in Ireland. It's the largest. Five zero. Five zero. Largest. Across activity. seven states and Youngstown. It's is the, the largest, largest hospital. Well, I had no idea. It's one of two level one trauma centers in our ministry. Wow. It, the hospital at Boardman has the largest maternity unit in our ministry. Really? Yeah. So... so- those when people when people think about you know it's almost like um, not going to the college that's in your hometown because everybody works there so it can't be a good college. But right. then you step back and you move out of town. You look at the college and you're like, my gosh, I right. would go there. I would give my arm to go there. Right. right? I, I would go there. And, and I think sometimes 
we have that attitude uh, when we look at our local performance, not just in healthcare, but in other areas, we don't realize the, the jewels really that exist in the community. Um, Mercy Health just being one of those, but there are many others, both in education and manufacturing and in other, um, the arts and other areas that I think sometimes if we took a half a step back from and, and, and reflected on them without the name and without the location, we would say, oh my gosh, that's a spectacular entity. Right. And they, then you plaster the name on it, you plaster the location. People are like, oh my gosh, that's right next door. Right. Um, you know, one of the, one of the things we talk about all the time is that um, as a level one trauma center in Youngstown, we have to employ trauma surgeons, right? You have to employ trauma surgeons if you're a trauma center by definition. We have six of them. People say, well, wait a second. That's weird. Six trauma surgeons living in Youngstown. I'm like, yeah, six trauma surgeons walking around, shopping to the same stores, going to the same ball games as you. But, but the facility doesn't exist without them. And there are a myriad of other specialists who must exist for us to keep that framework in place, whether they be intracranial neurosurgeons or orthopedic spine surgeons or anesthesiologists or cardiac surgeons. And people don't sometimes realize that, that, that those assets um, take time to cultivate mm -hmm. and, and an enormous amount of effort to um, keep aligned with our mission because those individuals as individuals have their own lives. They have their own families. They have their own aspirations. And many of them can go anywhere in the country. And we have to stop and think about that and say, wait, wait, wait a second. What do we, what do we have here? Why do these people come and why do they stay? Right. One of, the, one of the things that people said to me when I was interviewing uh, for my current role was, um, John, understand, understand that we have a hard time recruiting physicians to the Mahoney Valley. And, and at the time, I, that didn't make a lot of sense to me. And today it makes less sense to me. We have a medical staff of 900 physicians at our three hospitals, 900 wow. physicians and 300 advanced practice clinicians, CRNAs, nurse practitioners, PAs and midwives. So th there's not a hard time. That's, it's more of a mindset. And yeah. it's the same mindset that I think prevents us from sometimes recognizing the opportunity that exists right in front of us. If only we grab it. No, you're right. We take it for granted, right? We really take for granted. Um, there's this notion that the grass is always greener. You know, mm -hmm. um, so many people, part of why we started the brain gain was there is a, you know, an outflow for decades now, an outflow of population mm -hmm. leaving to go to, you know, Cleveland, Columbus, Chicago, South to the Carolinas. And do you, um, you know, I think recognizing kind of the advantages we have, the benefits we have, the new economic development we have, and the fact that, you know, I, I'm not sure, I personally was never aware of the fact there were 900 practicing physicians and, and 300, is that, what, those are the numbers again, 900 and 300? 900 and 300. Wow. That's that. It's great to share. So these are all great, like I said, great things to share. I want to talk about um, from a branding standpoint, St. E's, St. Elizabeth's legacy brand, strong mm -hmm. brand. I'm sure people to this day, how has Mercy either embraced or tried to change the narrative, or what's that? What's that look like? You know, how do you you know? People still refer to it as St. E's. Right. Yeah, and, and that's uh, that, that's a, that's a sort of its greatest strength, if you would. It's a secret sauce in many ways, because people do have that that memory. But at the same time, um, we are in some ways successful because we're bigger than that now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think people are very familiar with Saint Elizabeth, and all the time people say, "I was born there." I'm like, "That's great." Some of our leaders were born there. You know. Right. Um, and people were very familiar with the humility of Mary or the sisters of the humility of Mary and the humility of Mary health partners. And then they were very familiar again with this next iteration, which was expanding and becoming part of Mercy Health, which was um, more of an Ohio based entity. And then uh, two and a half years ago, we, we merged with Bond Secor Health on the, on the Atlantic coast. Um, then last year we, we purchased the largest private health system in Ireland. And as we've grown, as we've grown, it's been important from my perspective for us to maintain our local identity mm -hmm. yet at the same time, be absolutely willing to leverage that large organization. We are now the fifth base, excuse me, fifth largest faith-based health system in the country and the 12th largest system in the country overall. It's important for us to leverage that. Um, 
you know, people often say, hey, if we just had a seat at the table, and I say all the time, we have a seat at the table. Right. <laughs> we right. have a seat at the table. Actually, it's our table. Right. <laughs> it's yeah. our table, and people our are table. using our table. You right? have, you sit here and here. Yeah. 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 You can sit, sit down beside me. So it's, it's, it's being sure that we don't lose that identity, that, that historical identity, that legacy. Yet at the, at the same time, at the same time, being comfortable working in such a matrixed environment with such a large corporate entity. And, and, and being sure that the bi-directional flow of information exists such that you can leverage the strengths of both. Right, right. Well, so are there um, are there leadership books you read? So are you an avid, you know, business book or management book or leadership book reader? Yeah, I, I'm not so much a business or management book reader. I am very much a... <laughs> I wouldn't say podcast, yeah. <laughs> but uh, a management podcast, management article, management research type person. Um, you know, my my kids will laugh at me because I'll say randomly at dinner, hey, I was reading this cool article in the Harvard Business Review today. And they're like, Dad, who reads that? Yeah. Right. I'm like, I don't know. It was I kind of enjoyed it, you know, or or pivot and say, hey, I was reading today in the New England Journal of Medicine. And they were talking about um, the success of vaccines. Mm -hmm. uh, here or there. I had a very interesting opportunity just this week to be on a call with the Israeli Ministry of Health. Um, and there were a total of 14 of us on the call, um, people from Israel and people from the state of Ohio, talking about the the the, the wins if they've had uh, as it relates to vaccinating their population, but also the challenges and then learning a bit one right. from the other in terms of how we manage the challenges. And to me, that's that's stimulating. Like that that's Absolutely. where it's at. Right. And how having the opportunity to, to relate to an individual in that manner that I would otherwise have had no business to ever meet. Right. Um, right. Is something hopefully that we both take something more away. So I'm, and it probably relates to why I went into emergency medicine, why I sort of had the management style that I have. I am much more inclined to be involved in a dynamic learning environment than I am a more passive in, environment and passive meaning. I'm going to read a couple hundred page book. Frankly, my attention span isn't that long. Right. So, so <laughs> let's take it in, 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 in little bites. Right. Absolutely. Well, and that uh, goes back to human physiology, right? So learning from, say, clinicians in Israel and, and they've, are they vaccinating ahead of us? I mean, are they, would you say they're on track? They, a third of their population has been vaccinated. Wow. Wow. Yes. Yes. They're, they're, <laughs> yes, they're vaccinating ahead of us. But what's so interesting is that they're entirely voluntary in their vaccination, no different than us. So there's no mandate for vaccination uh, in Israel. Um, there's just a very different message and, and a very different uh, logistical structure supporting it. I see. Do you see us um, things improving? Are you satisfied with the current process, the current methods in which we're, you know, getting folks vaccinated? Um, I would absolutely love to have more vaccine to distribute. Okay, and I think that's that's the challenge. I think many of us are feeling we've we've built structures. You know, help, think about it historically. Uh, acute care hospital systems don't vaccinate. That's not what we do. We take care of sick people, right? Right. Um, over the course of years, we've started to take um, care of people who have chronic medical conditions and focus on wellness and population health. But acute care hospitals and most people who work in them have never staffed a vaccination clinic other than our annual flu vaccine. That's that's sort of not what we've done. And so you're you're you have these these healthcare entities pivoting um, to provide a service that they've never really provided, but but absolutely committed. And in many communities, being the the sole organization that has the the capacity to to drive volume. Right. So you know we've we've established a structure uh, locally in partnership with county health departments and city health departments. It's it's been actually a a story and success of collaboration. It's been very very positive. But despite all this capacity we have to vaccinate now, our, our supply of vaccine is very irregular. Hmm. And the means and the means to schedule those vaccinations is is um, tough challenge. challenged. And that's in talking to the Israelis, that was one of the biggest takeaways. And probably the biggest secret to their success is that um, they have a, a, a national structure through which they do that scheduling. Um, that already existed, that already existed. So they were just able to leverage that where, you know, our local health departments don't have that. that that's not what they do. And our acute care hospitals take care of the patients that come there, but they're not used to reaching out to de novo people in the community to, to vaccinate them. And the structure for that just doesn't exist. And I think all too often people have said, hey, we're going to establish a call line, a call center. 
you can call us and we can schedule you, right? Some of the some of the experiences with that across the country have been just astounding with the call volumes that they've received and the, the, the inability of the current uh, telephonic structures to support that. So mm-hmm. it's just not something that we as a country have done. So yeah, this the this scale and the visibility and, and the ability to forecast, right? So if there's a constant flow and it's coming from what I would call, you know, a top-down or national perspective, mm-hmm. then you can route it the appropriate way and right that scale and infrastructure existed. So I, I guess does that impact the future of healthcare? So th- let's talk for a minute about, you know, here we are in the current situation talking about vaccinations and and scale and getting to you know some type of mass penetration. What's the future of healthcare look like uh, relative to what we learn? Relative to is this a career that kids could, should consider? And if so, which areas do you think they would uh, find fascinating? Yeah, yeah. So th- this is a very interesting question. We have seen the healthcare landscape not only locally but across the country change dramatically in the past year. It's changed at a rate that exceeds the change that occurs in most of our lifetimes, and we've seen it in a course of several months. Um, we've seen locally and across the country, emergency department utilization drop dramatically. Um, that's good if those people have access to care and they were coming to the emergency department for primary care. That's bad if people with chest pain or stroke symptoms are sitting at home and not seeking care. So um, the messaging around the appropriate utilization of resources um, is something that we're focusing on. And I think we need to focus on as we move forward. What we're seeing is that the average person in the hospital is dr- dramatically, dramatically might be a slightly strong word, but I'll use dramatically, more ill than they were a year ago. So when we look at our, our budgeting, our staffing, or our, or our capital uh, asset acquisition, um, we're dealing with a different population of people in the hospitals than we had historically. Um, one of the challenges we had in the early wave, the, the spring um, surge, if you would, was the access to ventilators. That's something we heard about in the news all the time, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, many newscasters would have gone their entire career and never said the word ventilator. Right. And they were saying it 20 times in, a, in, a, in one newscast, right? Um, I, think, I think we, as a, as a society, had uh, not uh, effectively anticipated the dramatic needs that can occur in, in this type of a scenario. So our, our need for intensive care unit beds is something that's increased dramatically. And what we found is that many of those patients aren't COVID patients. Many of those patients are, are quote, regular patients with regular problems. But but in general, the hospitals are taking care of a sicker population of patients, uh, requiring um, a different level of uh, not only care, but a different level of specialization as it relates to the, the professionals, whether those professionals be nurses or pharmacists or respiratory therapists or physicians that are providing that care um, and the market for all of those human assets is, is tight and the pipeline to train them is long. So you can't flip on a switch and create a cardiac surgeon. Um, that's a, you know, a decade and a half pipeline. So the same thing exists in all of those areas. It, the, the pipeline, if you would, the educational pipeline is longer than is the, the need or the surge. So right. how do we prepare for that? And we move forward. And I think one of the things that, that I found, uh, and it's been, um, probably one of the most rewarding parts of the pandemic for me personally is that our relationships with our educational institutions in the region have become very, very strong. Um, we've collaborated uh, locally with Kent state in a way that we haven't historically. We collaborate with Youngstown state continuously uh, daily would not be an exaggeration. We have a very, very good relationship with Eastern gateway. Um, we have a, a, a vibrant and growing relationship with, with Neomed and the, the medical students they're educating um, mm-hmm. that really serve as a, a resource to us. And we've locally in the, in the medical community redoubled our efforts to, to educate physicians through graduate medical education programs. We have nine residency programs right now um, in our hospitals uh, educating physicians in their various specialties. And as recently as yesterday, we were uh, approved to have our first fellowship program in palliative and hospice care. Wow. So, I mean, all throughout the educational pipeline, people have been awakened. And to your question, should people enter healthcare? The answer is absolutely, absolutely. But I think um, when we say enter healthcare, all too often people think enter healthcare means I'm going to be a nurse or enter healthcare means I'm going to be a physician. 
I think what people need to realize is there are really a, a myriad of options available for people um, at all different levels of the educational spectrum um, where people can seek uh, employment and have gainful employment and, and many times use that as a stepping stone to advance their career to uh, more and more complex uh, positions. Right. Well, John, this, um, you know, you're right. We often say the one of the outcomes of the pandemic and not, you know, if, if you can say positive outcome of the pandemic, but you're right, there's stronger and more um, integrated relationships with our educational institutions, creating that pipeline of talent, because we do, we do have, you know, sounds like you're very bullish on the future in our region. Uh, the momentum is here and it's strong. And as you also mentioned, recognizing the assets we have in place today and celebrating that. And then the, you know, the future of healthcare, do, you know, it sounds like the, you know, the pandemic obviously disrupted the equilibrium we had. Do you feel like this shock to the system will result in a better healthcare system for the future? It'll be more nimble for sure. Nimble. Yeah. It'll be more nimble for sure. And I think, you know, it's, it's the pandemic has been an incredibly sad yet incredibly invigorating experience for many of us in healthcare leadership roles, because it's given us an opportunity to march forward into a space that no playbook had been designed to navigate. Right. And uh, if, if you want that, and if you find that challenging and rewarding, that opportunity doesn't come along very often. Right. At the same, at the same time, it's been incredibly disruptive. Um, and not all of that disruption has been positive at all. Uh, it's disrupted people's lives in ways that we could, again, couldn't have imagined. Uh, but I think to the extent that we can, we have an obligation to the community to um, provide support. Sometimes that support through opportunity. And that's mm-hmm. very much the way I look at it, uh, frankly, is that if, if, if we have a displaced worker, well, then let's find a place for that displaced worker to be trained and re-enter the workforce. We have positions for you. Let's, let's just get you trained so you can be in that position. Right. And then we'll advance you. Like, we'll support that as much as we can. So, again, it's, it's been a very mixed blessing. Um, some days very frustrating, as I, I'm sure you can imagine. Some days quite, quite rewarding in ways that you, you wouldn't have anticipated. Well, John, thanks so much for your thoughtful responses to all of uh, the, the myriad of questions I've thrown your way. But uh, we're going to wrap up our conversation. I hope we can have another one because I I have so many threads and th- so many topic areas I'd love to delve into more. But uh, really great to hear that uh, you know, you're bullish on the future of healthcare and that, yes, it's been a shock to the system you know, negatively and positively and that, um, you know, there's a lot we've learned and we'll just, this nation notion of nimbleness and agility, I think is something that we as a society, we're, we've all embraced across the board. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your time today and, and, uh, and thanks for joining us on the Brain Gain podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us on the podcast today because together we're building a culture of entrepreneurship and promoting workforce development. So if you like what you heard, please share it with a friend and leave us a rating or review on your favorite podcast player. Your feedback is very important to us. We want to make the show better all the time. And if you would like to give me direct feedback, email me, please. My email is J H E R R. M-A-N-N at business-journal.com or you can find me on LinkedIn. And lastly, would love to thank the members of the Brain Gain Coalition. Those headline collaborators include Farmers National Bank, Sweeney Chevrolet Buick GMC, the Mahoney Valley Manufacturers Coalition, and Southwoods Health. And joining them are members of the coalition, including Eastern Gateway Community College, PNC Bank, the Moransky Companies, MCCTC, the Mahoney County Career and Technical Center, the Youngstown Business Incubator, Simon Roofing, the DeBartolo Corporation, Youngstown State University, and Junior Achievement of Mahoney Valley. Without them, none of this would be possible. So thanks again for joining us today. And remember, together we are building a culture of entrepreneurship and promoting workforce development.
Thanks for watching the video. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that little bell for notifications. And also make sure to connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. For all of your business news, visit businessjournaldaily.com. For all of your arts and entertainment news, go to afterhoursyoungstown.com.